the AWS Financial Services Symposium, presented by The Cube. Good morning, nerd fam, and welcome to New York City. We're here at AWS Financial Services Symposium. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching The Cube, and I am super excited for this next conversation, not only because he's wearing glitter, but because he's brilliant. Please welcome to the stage, Junta. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you for having me. This is going to be such a fun chat to start the morning. Topic of this conversation is surviving and thriving in Gen AI. Lots of people feeling really overwhelmed right Mm -hmm. now. Also excited. There's hype. There's overwhelm. What what are you seeing? You must be seeing a lot. Yeah, well, data bricks. you know, I think Gen AI has the ability to really transform financial services in ways that it hasn't been able to transform in 20 or 30 years. So if you think about like how you interact with your bank or how you interact with your insurance company, I would my imagine favorite, my favorite interaction. Exactly. <laughs> um, I would imagine it probably hasn't changed in 20 or 30 years. No. Right. And if you think about how you b- watch a movie or how you buy something, that has transformed massively over that period of time. I think what Gen AI is probably going to let, let uh, enable financial service companies to do is to really innovate the experience that you have and ultimately improve your NPS scores if you're a bank or an insurance company. Because just like you just said, I read the study maybe a few months ago that said the average Gen Z person would rather go to the dentist than to their bank branch, right? So the, the experience wow. is not very uh, pleasant for a lot of people. And I think being, personal, uh, being able to do personalization, being able to uh, yeah. give new types of advice, that's going to transform the way people interact with their financial service institutions going forward. So lots of excitement. And I think there's going to be massive benefits from that. There is a lot of excitement. And, and that's an incredible data point. Oh my gosh, the dentist versus, I mean, I would rather go to the ATM than go to the dentist <laughs> if we're really, if we're really thinking, but shout out to Gen Z. Yeah. I say this with love, Financial services is not always known as the fastest moving industry when it comes to technology adoption due to governance and and regulation. How is it different now with the AI hype curve than Mm -hmm. saying we saw other digital transformation? Yeah. So, you know, I think that AI has become a CEO level initiative. Right. And I call this kind of the, you know, the the Gen, Gen AI theater curve, which is, you know, ChatGPT comes out, people get really excited. Every CEO says we're now an AI company. Right. And, 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 and now there's a lot of press about how they're doing this and it's wonderful. But then we're kind of in the next phase where you know, it's not just kind of the theatrics of, of talking about it. There is now difficult decisions that have to be made about how are we going to monetize our tech stack? How are we going to democratize data and AI across the organization? And then how are we going to actually transform? So it's all good because it's actually led to a chain of events where people are now rethinking, well, what do we? What are the decisions that we need to make more upstream in the tech stack to be able to enable right. all these different things? So, so this is what's happening, and you know, as a result of that, at Databricks, financial services has become our single biggest vertical and one of the fastest growing verticals. And and I've been here for you know five six years. If you asked me in 2019, is financial services going to be the largest vertical in in the near future? I probably would have said no because we're we're a cloud yeah. native company, right? Right. So in, and back then there wasn't a whole lot of I would say it's you're still right. early yeah. um, in the cloud journey back then. But fast forward to today, I think CEOs and executives realize that if we're going to play in this AI space and if it, AI is really important for us, then we have to be on the cloud. We have to democratize data. Right? We have to have a modern platform. And, and these are kind of the tailwinds that, that we see right now in financial it, services. It's, it is interesting. And it's nice to see that progression. So yeah. it is, do you think it's in response to the technical revolution that we're having right now that this has become that number one vertical for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I think there's two reasons for this, right? One is that, you know, the single biggest driver of expenses for any financial service company is people. Mm-hmm. So if people are the single biggest expense item, you want to get the most out of your people, right? You want to increase productivity. And if you think about Gen AI, and we, we track this all the time, the vast, vast majority of Gen AI use cases in financial services are just for internal uses, right? Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily to drive revenues right now. It's just to get people more productive. So if your biggest asset is people, Gen AI is an ability to increase the productivity of people. So it, it's kind of a no-brainer uh, to focus on this. The second thing is that the, the revenue pool hasn't really increased in financial services for a very long time, right? So the last two years, we've had this massive tailwind of interest rates going up. Mm-hmm. And that just means that banks were more profitable. But my guess is over the next two or three years, you know, interest rates are probably not going to be at the same elevated level as they are today. Let's hope not. So, so they're gonna, <laughs> the banks are going to have to find new sources of revenue 
uh, new ways to interact with our customers, new products to sell people. So this is where kind of that, you know, uh, revolution is going to be powered by. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why there's such a big focus on the tech decisions you need to make in order to power so, kind of so what is going to change from a banking perspective? What, what, what is our new banking experience going to be like then? Um, I think everything has got to change, actually. So um, I think the future of money is probably going to be three things. Okay, It's going to be inclusive, it's going to be instant, and it's going to be invisible. Okay? okay. And what I mean by that is, you know, just inclusiveness is like, there's millions and millions of people in the United States, for example, that are unbanked or underbanked because... The way things work today, you kind of have to be part of the financial service ecosystem to be a customer of financial services. So I have a colleague I, yeah, who just moved really to the point. United States. Yeah. He's, you know, I'm sure he's a very credit worthy person, but in the first credit card he got his limit was, yeah, his credit limit was hundred dollars, right? And if you think about that, that's that's you know, the data exists to be able to serve this person, right? So mm -hmm. it, there's a way to become more inclusive of that, right? Um, instant is exactly what I said before. If you can watch a movie, any movie you want instantly. Why does it take you 45 days to get a mortgage? Right. right? So, so, you know, that's another thing. And the part of the last part is invisible. What I simply mean by that is, you know, maybe you take Uber. Maybe you took an Uber here this morning, right? You got in and you left. You didn't even think about mm -hmm. paying. Mm -hmm. And I think increasingly payments and finished service is going to just be part of a lot of experiences and software and things that you interact with. And I think that presents massive opportunities and challenges for incumbents, right? Yeah. So, so that's kind of the, the way I think things are going to evolve over the next a few years, but it's going to be really exciting because we're going to have lots of innovation that in a sector we historically haven't had a whole lot of innovation. Yeah. To your point. You're getting me excited about banking, which I can't say I've been excited about right, yeah. <laughs> in a hot minute. So do you, so since you get to see a lot of different companies mm -hmm. approaching this, does it feel like the entire industry is on this wavelength or do you see, and you don't have to name names, mm -hmm. but do you see some folks adopting quicker? Cause it sounds like this will be a dramatically different banking experience. Yeah. And, and payment experience, yeah. frankly. Um, it, it, you know, it varies, right? So I, I kind of think about it in three different steps, as I mentioned before. First part is the modernization of your technology stack. The second thing is democratization of data and AI through your organization. And the last part is transformation, all right? So if I had to put a number on it, the vast majority of our customers or just banks or insurance companies in general are still in that modernization phase, right? They're trying to figure out how do we get things out you know, uh, um, for into the cloud? How do we bring modern tools? How do we get the most out of the data, et cetera? So I would imagine like the vast majority of a company is there. And then there's a handful of companies that are now democratizing data and AI. I think there's massive returns for that. Actually. Absolutely. And then on the transformation f side, you know, we work with a lot of joint customers with AWS from JP Morgan to Northwestern Mutual to FactSet. I mean, they're doing incredible things. And A, they have very forward-thinking leaders. They have a modern tech platform. And I think there's going to be, over the next few years, a big difference between the early adopters and the laggers in the type of, um, in the way, in their ability to drive profits and, and gain market share uh, in the market over the next few years. Interesting. So it's going to be a whole new ballgame. What experience do you hope you never have to have banking in the future? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I think... I think it's, it's what I said before. It's the time delay. Yeah. Right. And it's also kind of the intrusiveness mm -hmm. in a sense. So, so imagine, you know, you're, you want life insurance. Okay. And, and that's a pretty intrusive process today. You have to answer all these different I, things. I have life insurance right? and I know exactly what you're talking about. You have to get a blood test. You yeah. have to do all this. But if you kind of think about it, why do you need to do that? Right. If you have data on a population, you have lots of customers, so you, you know, you're kind of, act, you know, actuarial science, mm -hmm. you could probably make decent underwriting decisions pretty quickly without being that intrusive into someone's personal life to get life insurance. So, so I think yeah. that that's one of the things that will happen is that data and AI is going to power new types of experiences that's going to be much more, make it much more pleasant. So going back to that dentist, yeah. you know, just like you've already been converted, you can't wait to go yeah. to a bank branch now or an insurance <laughs> agent, right? So I think that's hopefully what will happen, which I don't have to deal with anymore. I do like that though. It's it's a less invasive and, and it can be a really violating experience. I'm, I'm an entrepreneur and I went, I remember going to try and co-sign on my mom's mortgage to help her out. And the bank looked at my income like it didn't matter, even though it was more than a peer who would have been with a with a standard paycheck. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully there will be ways where that 
credibility is validated with a less invasive process yes. to your point, yep. not yep. a blood test, whatever. Right. Yep. You've mentioned the term democratizing data a couple different times when we talk about how you know democratiz democratization of AI and a lot of things. What does it mean from a Databricks perspective to democratize data? It's providing the power of data and analytics to a vaster majority or, or a much bigger group of folks at your organization than before. So if if you think about like an average company today, so let's say there's a company of 10,000 people. How many people can do data in AI today of those 10,000? I would imagine 100, couple hundred, right? It's, it's a very small percentage of, of the per sure. What I mean by democratization is that for to become a data forward or data driven company, you cannot just have people in this small silo being able to interact and curate and get insights from the data, you need to have the entire organization being able to do that. So that's what I mean by that. And, and, and the real sort of the, the, the democratization factor is going to be the innovations that we've seen in Gen AI, right? So mm -hmm. imagine if you had to get a, a dashboard and in the past, you you had to ask somebody in the database team. You had to know. Yeah, you got to you got to you basically got to bribe your BI guy. Yeah, you, you yeah. need to know stuff. But yeah. imagine you know today, especially within Databricks, you could ask Databricks to say, "Hey, create me a chart of the stock price for this company over the last three months." Mm -hmm. Right? Like you don't need to rely on others, and that's what you mean by democratization. And that's incredibly important in financial services because the two most important asset that any financial service company has today. I think it's two things. It's just data in your people. Yep. That's it. Yep. Right. And and maybe ten years ago that was different. Ten years ago you might have said, hey, capital and and our scale. So number of branches and how much money we have maybe have been the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying those are not important anymore. I'm just saying to 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 add your data and your people together on top of the foundation that you built, that's incredibly powerful. So I think that's gonna that's what's happening actually. It yeah. is, it is. Is it an is it an exciting time to be at Databricks? Absolutely. We're excited for your show next week. Yes, we're excited to uh, have you. Are you going to have any big announcements you can tease for that? Uh, I think uh, I think you can, you know, if we could wait. You're going to have to wait. You're going to have to wait. Uh, wait, to wait, wait a little bit. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, we're super. There's going to be well over 10,000 people there um, It's in person. It's going to be fantastic. Oh, it is going to be. Yeah. And I am, I am super excited. Okay. So next time we're at AWS Financial Services Symposium a year from now, what do you hope to be able to say then that you can't say yet today? Um. You know, I, I would hope to say that a lot of the use cases, as I mentioned earlier, most Gen AI use cases today are happening for internal productivity purposes, right? I would hope to say a year from now that many FSIs have started to use Gen AI and the power of a and Gen AI to power revenue, new sources of revenue, new products. I think we're still in the earlier yeah. phases of that. And, and I would like to say, for example, your banking application that you have on your phone, mm -hmm. right? Right now, there's basically no AI in there. Mm -hmm. A year from now, I would imagine that AI is going to be in every software. Gen AI is going to be in every software. So the way you interact it, it just with your banking application is going to be completely different. So a, a year from now, I would hope that we would have incredible, you know, experiences that we could share and kind of, you know, re re reminisce about a year ago. Be like, can you imagine a year ago we had to do this because we could do this today? And that's going to be powered, hopefully, by Databricks and, and AWS on the back. Well, we look forward to that. Last opportunity I'm going to give you. You own a wonderful watering hole in Brooklyn. Shout out. Well, if folks are interested in sake, where can they find you when you're not? Um, yeah, so uh, I'm a part owner of uh, America's largest craft sake brewery called uh, Brooklyn Kura. It's based in uh, in Sunset Park in Industry City in Brooklyn. It's uh, distributed nationwide. Um, and, you know, I love it because it's kind of the, you know, opposite of, of Databricks, right? Like, yeah, Databricks, we're, you know, if you think about it, it's, it's, it's kind of like, uh, Databricks in, in the business of driving massive innovation, completely changing how things are done, right? Sake is a process that's a thousand years old that basically hasn't changed in a thousand years and probably not going to change in the next thousand years because it's a very manual process. So right. I love being exposed to those two kind of, you know, polar opposite dichotomies. And I think yeah. it gives me my, my left brain or my right brain ability to uh, go into overdrive. But yes, it's available in a lot of places. <laughs> yeah. 
I, 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 I love that. We'll have to have a conversation, maybe, maybe the cube after dark about the intersection of, of sake data and AI. Yeah. Jinta, thank you so much for spending the time with me yeah, this morning. Thanks this for having me. Fantastic start of the day. And we can't wait to be at your event next week. Awesome. And thank all of you for tuning in to our fantastic all day coverage. We've got 15 different segments here at AWS Financial Services Symposium. We're here in New York City. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching the cube, the leading source for enterprise tech news. Sweet.